Stay tuned. Ahead, I'll talk with Gregory Maguire about new releases of his novels, The Wicked Years series, and the upcoming Wicked Movies. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. Although he's written 10 other adult novels and 20 children's novels, Gregory Maguire is best known as the best-selling author of Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West, and its three sequels, Son of a Witch, A Lion Among Men, and Out of Oz. Collectively, these novels are known as the Wicked Years series, and the Broadway musical based on Wicked is now the fourth longest-running play in Broadway history, and the play is inspired a two-film project being released in 2024 and 2025. We'll talk about the new releases and the upcoming movies. Gregory, welcome to Some Books Considered. Thank you so much. It's Dan, right? I'm very happy to be with you, Dan. Well, good to have you along as well. Uh, this has almost been 30 years, hard to believe, since the original one came out. So tell us about that original inspiration. Why did you want to tell the backstory here of the Wicked Witch of the West? Well, Dan, my original ambition wasn't really to tell a backstory of anything. It was to find a story that I could tell that would entice my readers to examine a few important intellectual and, I suppose, moral questions, such as, why do we call some people evil? And what agency over them does it give us if we decide we're the good ones and they're the bad ones? How does that leverage our power and our self-permission to hurt them? That's really what I was interested in. And I thought of a number of different possible ways to attack the problem. But I remembered there's a famous old adage in the instruction of writing, which says, write what you know, write what you know. And I thought to myself, well, what do I know? I know church music and I know children's books. Where's the evil in any of that. And then I had my moment of inspiration in this life, which is the clouds parted and I looked up in a pious way and I sort of thought the Virgin Mary might come out of the clouds because I'd been expecting her for a few decades, but it wasn't the Virgin Mary, it was Margaret Hamilton. And she was saying, I'll get you and your little dog. And I thought, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, I've just, I've just had a vision. Everybody knows that she's evil. It's even part of her name, the Wicked Witch of the West. That's She's wicked. She has no other name. She's just bad. That means that she has been predetermined to be okay for killing. If we say that she's an enemy and she's bad, we have the moral privilege of taking her out. And I just, my, everything got electrified in my skull and my cranium. And I thought, it's perfect. I also knew my children's book lore. I knew the film very well, but I also knew the early L. Frank Baum novels, The Wizard of Oz, The Land of Oz, one or two of the other ones, the early ones. And I knew that L. Frank Baum wasn't an historian in the same way that, say, Tolkien would become or, uh, C.S. Lewis about Narnia, he was using characters in a um, almost more of a vaudeville way, bringing them in for what they could do for the plot at the moment and then letting them kind of wither on the vine. He didn't need for her to have a name, but I needed for her to have a name because only when she had a name would we actually have permission to care about her. And that's what I wanted people to do. So in this book, as you point out, it becomes a vehicle for telling a story, a moral story about the dangers of othering people. And once they become a other, then they're not really human. Absolutely. This has gone on you know, since, I think, the Trojan War. And it's part of every military operation uh, in the history of the, the subsequent, what is it, 3,500 years since the Trojan War. Uh, but... It also happens on the street and on the playground and in the cocktail party and in the hospitals and the drug wards and in the uh, homes for people with debilities. An othering instinct rather than a mothering instinct seems to be almost higher, hardwired into us. It's sad, but it's true. We have to accept it 
only in accepting that we're inclined to do that can we possibly have the hope of resisting the inclination when we feel it taking hold of us. Well, as you said, you had to give the Wicked Witch of the West a name so she's personified, then we can care about her. But tell us about the inspiration for the name. Well, her name is Elphaba. And the funny thing is, uh, Dan, when she was eventually collected to appear on the Broadway stage, one of the questions that Stephen Schwartz, the composer of Wicked, and Winnie Holtzman, the book writer, the, the script writer of the play, as it were, asked me was, how do you pronounce her name? Is it Elphaba? And I said, no, it's not Elphaba. Elphaba sounds like she's making a tuna nuda casserole for the church supper on Friday night. Uh, no, she's Elphaba. Stress is on the first syllable, the same way it is in the name Dorothy. And also for that matter, in the name Margaret and Hamilton, Elphaba. And I invented that name as an homage to the original author of The Wizard of Oz, whose name was Lyman Frank Baum, published as L. F. Baum, Elphaba. I aspirated it, tried it in different ways. I tried Lafaba, I tried different things. But once I got to Elphaba, boy, Dan, did I love that because it has overtones of things like alphabet, like a magic alphabet for casting a magic spell or fabulous alphaba, something different. And once she became alphaba, I was very pleased. It's not a pretty name. I don't expect that there, after the movie comes out in um, six or eight weeks, I don't expect there are going to be a rash of babies named alphaba the way after Peter Pan came out, there were a rash of girls named Wendy. Did you know that J.M. Barry invented the name Wendy? It wasn't a name before Peter Pan. He invented it and it became, you know, a name. I know a woman named Wendy who's in her 90s. <laughs> you know, it's just become uh, an acceptable name. The same thing isn't going to happen with Alphaba, partly because I didn't want it to be a pretty word, but I wanted it to be distinctive and memorable. Well, for anyone who hasn't read Wicked, it's so involved, we can't go into a lot of details because there is so rich in information here. But what would you say is kind of a, a plot overview of what people will find there? Well, I wanted to write in Wicked the story of a green-skinned baby starting on the day that she was born and ending on the day that she disappears from our view. Maybe she's dead, maybe she's not. That's up for the readers to decide. And I wanted to do it in such a way that approximated a 19th century novel, not unlike um, Great Expectations or Oliver Twist or David Copperfield. So there would have to be lots of different scenes taking place over many decades in order for us to see how this woman's character was formed in childhood, uh, both because and despite the peculiarity of being born green, in a population that was not otherwise green, and how she was importuned by society and how she made her own way anyway. This is a story of all of us. We're all born peculiar. <laughs> we may, it may not be as evident as having green skin, but none of us are like any other person, and we still have to make our own way and, with luck, stamp ourselves on the world in a way that is more beneficial than it is harmful. That's what I wanted to do. So the novel Wicked starts with the day she's born and ends when she's 38 and Dorothy splashes that bucket of water and spends time in almost every decade of her life bringing her to the final splash. I'm talking with Gregory Maguire about the reissued Wicked Years novels box set and the new deluxe edition of the original Wicked novel. And our conversation continues in a moment. If you're enjoying this discussion, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you know when I post new interviews. And thank you. And one of the reasons I'm talking with you is that there's a, a reissue of that original book. It's uh, called a, a deluxe reissue, and I show it here. It has the green and also the green on the side, which is great. And it has a ribbon for, you know, marking your place as you're reading it. It's a, a special new edition. And I'm curious about your thoughts about it. One of the things I love about it, because <laughs> I've gotten 30 years older since the novel was first published, 
and my eyes are not as strong as they were, is that the type is bigger and the pages are more generous. It's actually, in terms of number of pages, it's a little bit longer than the original hardbound edition. And that way, I think it's easier to read. It's not a large print edition, don't get me wrong. It's not, if it were a large print edition, it would be 900 pages. But it's nonetheless more generous and more welcoming and easier, I think, to lose yourself in. Boy, do I love the green foil and the gold foil that they used on the cover. And if you look at the outline of the Wicked Witch in that uh, gold dome uh, in which she's, she's pictured there, I'll tell you, I drew that outline myself. That's my drawing of the Wicked Witch. They had somebody else who looked more stereotypical. And I thought, no, she's spikier and she's more acrobatic and more energetic. And the way they have her on that cover, I love it because she could be standing in front of the moon, which is a very witchy thing to do, but she also could be standing in front of a spotlight about to deliver a big belty number at 1045 in the evening, because that's what she's so well known for in this culture, once Wicked the musical uh, hit the boards 21 years ago. And it's hard to believe it's been that long, too. And in a moment, I want to talk to you about the movies that will be coming out. But I want to talk further. This is just the first book in a series of books that you've written, uh, which has become known as The Wicked Years. And there's a new box set that is out now with new designs, redesigned covers, and just a, a very attractive combination of books. Tell us a bit about where the story picks up after Wicked and continues with the following three novels. Well, it's, it's awfully hard to write a sequel to a novel in which the main character disappears on the last page of the first novel. But I reminded myself that the subtitle of Wicked is The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West. Now, the life may be over, or it may be over as far as we the readers can see, but the times of the witch are not over. Your time and my time, Dan and Gregory, are not over after we die. Our time continues through the lives of our children, and if we know them, the lives of their children. And so I thought that's my license to keep writing. The second book in the Wicked Year sequence is called Son of a Witch, and it is about the boy who spends most of his novel wondering Actually, is he the witch's son? He's not green-skinned, so how can he tell? Uh, he has spent all his life with her, but she has never uttered an opinion about it. And then the books that follow, follow on with from what happens there. You have kindly shown that beautiful box set. And if you look at the spines where the titles are, you see that the four books line up and make kind of a, a horizon of Oz and of story. And uh, I love the way the designers of these books put all that together for us. And just a little bit of a tease here, and I'm hoping in next year that I can talk with you about it, but there's going to be another book in the series. There will be one more book. And I, I dare say it's a final book, but who knows? I have said that before, and then I've had another idea that seemed to need to be written. In about six months, five months maybe, I'm coming out with a book called Elfie. And what this is, is a depiction of the life of Elphaba, the green-skinned witch, between the ages of two and, let's say, 16. Where does this come from? Well, when I sent my original manuscript to my publisher 30 years ago, it was 550 pages. And HarperCollins wanted to publish it, but they said, you have to lose something from this because uh, we need, as readers, we need to get to where Alphaba meets Glinda, the Good Witch of the North, earlier. So I had to take out a few, not much, maybe eight pages of telling what happened to Alphaba when she was eight and when she was 10 and when she was 14. To me, these are very influential and important years in the life of any human being. But they had to be sacrificed on the cutting room floor 30 years ago just to make a sellable book. Uh, I never forgot, though, that childhood makes the adult. And so as Wicked, the story, escaped from my own backyard and became a juggernaut of a Broadway show and is scheduled to be an even bigger juggernaut of a film 
industry, it will never come home to roost again. And the intellectual property will outlive me, I'm sure. And people will be doing more with the tropes that I put down in the same way that I did more with the tropes that L. Frank Baum and MGM put down. So I thought, oh, God bless them if they do that. But while I'm still alive, I want to tell people what Elphaba's childhood was like. Somebody else can say, no, that wasn't it at all. But I still want my chance while I have the the power to say it. Well, as you mentioned, in November, the uh, first of two movies is coming out uh, with the Wicked story to it. And if you read the first novel, you'll learn about her university years and the people she meets there, and that's explored in the movie. What else can you tell us about these movies? Uh, Very little, Dan, because I haven't seen very much of them. I did fly to London about a year and a half ago, and I met the cast. I met Cynthia Erivo, who plays Elphaba. I met Ariana Grande, who plays Galinda, Glinda. I met Bowen Yang from Saturday Night Live and Jonathan Bailey and the whole, almost all of them. Uh, But I only watched them film about uh, one scene. And it took a whole week to get what I think is probably going to be not more than about four minutes of screen time. So much of it is a holy mystery to me. And I can't wait, like many other people in this uh, this world, I can't wait till November 22nd to buy myself a ticket and get some popcorn and go in and sit down and see what they have done to it. I think it's going to be magnificent from what few clips I've seen. But I won't know for sure until we all know for sure. I know that sometimes authors are a little bit wary about seeing their work translated into a different medium, because it is a different medium. Uh, But it sounds like you're excited about what they're doing with your books. Well, I am. I have a lot of confidence in all the people who are involved creatively. And also, I have the kind of humility, Dan, I'd like to think, that comes from the fact that I, too, borrowed somebody else's raw material to make something into it for myself. It's only dignified and honorable for me to have allowed the creators to shape my story into something that makes sense for them. I'd be, I'm not, I'm not so egocentric or narcissistic to think I know everything about everything. Now, I, I had a good story, had a good idea, gave it the best shot, let the people who know how to make movies make the best movie out of it that they can. The reissued novels in the Wicked Years series are by Gregory Maguire. Gregory, thank you for talking with me today. Oh, it's been a real pleasure, and I hope you have a a wonderful autumn, and I hope you get on November 22nd to go buy a couple of seats, buy a couple of tickets, and get a big popcorn, because you're going to need it. If you'd like to purchase the reissued Wicked Years box set or the deluxe hardback edition of Wicked, I've placed a link for you in the description below. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you know when I post new interviews. Meanwhile, here are two more interviews you might find interesting. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered.